I want to especially thank our liturgist, who I want to mention was here nearly an hour early and spent all that time focusing on what she was going to be reading. And I think that's worth mentioning. <clears throat> You have probably all heard about the 10th leper before, and I bet every clergy person has preached about the 10th leper. So it's probably not news to anybody here that this text shows us, first of all, Jesus' radical inclusivity. In healing all 10 lepers without distinction, he treated the ostracized Samaritan the same as the other nine. Now, as lepers, they were all outcasts, don't get me wrong. All were exiled from the community and obliged to announce themselves by shouting unclean should any from the community mistakenly wander near. But the Samaritan was an outcast among outcasts, rock bottom of the pecking order, outside the circle. And in our story, Jesus not only heals him, but then praises him for being the only one to come back and thank God for the favor. Once again, Jesus is inverting things, lifting up the downcast and not so subtly chastising the others. And certainly an important part of the lesson of this text for us as the body of Christ is to follow Jesus' lead in reaching out to the outcast, the Samaritans of our day. But this morning, I'd like to take a slightly different angle. In meditating on this text over the past week or so, the line that kept jumping out at me this time was the subtle and seemingly innocuous phrase, as they went. You'll remember that the story tells us that the lepers cried out to Jesus, saying, Master, have mercy on us, and that he said, Go and show yourself to the priests, which was the required protocol to be pronounced clean and allowed back into the community. And then it says that as they went, they were made clean. As they went, why not instantly as they stood interacting with Jesus as so many of the miracles are described? These words, as they went, were the quiet words that spoke to me as I prepared this time on this text. Well, the commentaries say that the phrase, as they went, could also be translated in their going. And that turn of phrase somehow strengthens the sense that there is something to be mined here. In their going, they were made clean, implies that there was something to the process of the going itself that was one ingredient in the healing. In other words, the healing was not an instant magic trick not unmediated and outside of the flow of normal life. It depended somehow on their walking that day's path. It evolved from within the warp and woof of their regular life. They were healed only when they integrated their encounter with Jesus into the ongoing business of their ordinary day. I don't know about you, but I, for one, am encouraged that we can apparently find healing, not just when we go to special healers or step outside of the daily round for some mystical, otherworldly interaction with God. Not that we shouldn't step out. Daily prayer and intentional immersion in the spirit are essential spiritual practices. But the healing, it seems to me, usually takes form and really develops when we step back into the course of the daily round and seek to live it out where the rubber meets the road, 
in the midst of our going. It is in the midst of ordinary daily life that spiritual transformation, the healing of our lower selves happens. The Deuteronomy text for this morning exhorts the people to remember the long way that the Lord has led you through the 40 years in the desert. In other words, remember that it's the long years of daily journey, often rife with tedium, as we tend to each day's obligations and details, as we deal with people, some of whom are difficult and drive us crazy. Remember that it's in the midst of all that messy, ordinary daily life in our going that we are being transformed bit by bit into the highest version of ourselves that God had in mind when creating us, which is our life's work. And for most of us, that process of transformation takes a lifetime. We get sudden lurches forward here and there like those lepers but for most of us, as with the Israelites, the task as a whole is a matter of taking the long way. Anne Lamott, in her book entitled Grace Eventually, Thoughts on Faith, tells this story about her son. We moved into our current house six years ago when Sam was 10. In the old house, our bedrooms had been very close together, but in the new place, we were separated by two rooms and two short hallways. Sam started coming into my room in the middle of the night, curling up on my bed with his own blanket. I tried the obvious ways of helping him get his confidence back, a nightlight, bribes, power ranger sheets, nothing worked. Finally, Sam and I came up with a solution. The first night, he put his sleeping bag and pillow right beside my bed, where our old dog, Sadie, could peer out at him adoringly. The second night, we moved the sleeping bag three feet away to the foot of my bed. The next night, he moved three more feet away. On the fourth night, he made it to the door. He slept there two nights before he was able to put his sleeping bag in the hall. I kept the door open. Are you okay? I called to him in the dark. Yeah, he said in his small but manly voice. The short hallway to the living room took three nights to master. Then there were four nights in the living room as he crept over land closer to the goal with four three feet scooches one stall, and one night when he had to drag his sleeping bag, sleeping bag back three feet. Sometimes he would call out, good night, mom, several times in order to hear my voice in reply. See you tomorrow, mom, love you, mom, doing okay out here, mom. A few times he called for me to come sit with him. My nearness lifted him. Sometimes grace works like water wings when you are sinking. And then at last, he spent his first night in his spooky new room, bravely on the floor. She continues, and you know, that's me, trying to make any progress at all with family, work, relationships, self-image, spiritual growth, all of it. Scooch, 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 stall, scooch, stall, catastrophic reversal, bog, bog, then ever so tiny scooch again. She says, I wish grace and healing were more abracadabra kinds of things. Also, I wish that delicate silver bells would ring to announce grace's arrival. But no, it's slog and scooch on the floor, in silence, in the dark. Kind of helps us understand why it took the Israelites 40 years, huh? 
while the wheels of the gods do grind slowly but exceedingly fine. And it's the daily stuff of life that makes up the wheels of the gods. And it is the long way for most of us. Slog, bog, scooch. We are given encouragement on the slow route of spiritual transformation by Teilhard de Chardin, who said this, above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediary stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. Yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that the divine hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. And there's more good news. There is something we can do to help grease the wheels, to lubricate the whole mechanism of spiritual transformation, of healing, and it too is, in, is unveiled in the leper's story. It's gratitude. Cicero said, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all other virtues. Alfred Painter said that saying thank you is more than good manners, it's good spirituality. And finally, Johannes Gertner said, to speak gratitude is courteous and pleasant, to enact gratitude is generous and noble, but to live out of gratitude is to touch heaven. These are strong statements and should compel us to look hard at the idea of living from a place of gratitude, which is not just about adding the perfunctory thank you to a good deed rendered on your behalf. It's about really learning to notice and really learning to linger over the delights and joys in life. The simple blessings that God has tucked into the long way that we are being led. To realize that even in hard times, God is working through it all to bring somehow a greater good. On the first Thanksgiving, after all, David DeWitt points out that the pilgrims had dug seven times more graves than they made cabins in Plymouth Colony. No Americans have been more impoverished than these who nevertheless set aside a day of Thanksgiving. Gratitude is not only good for the one who is its recipient, it's good for the one who offers it. We need to cultivate it as we do other disciplines by decision and practice and hard work by training ourselves to look for specific things for which to be grateful, and then by turning back to linger in the savoring of them, as did that 10th leper. We can't ignore the pain and suffering in life when it comes. It needs to be named and faced, but we can counterbalance it by learning to linger over the joy by learning not to take it for granted, by learning to oil the machinery of life with this gladsome balm of Gilead. One of the simplest but most effective spiritual disciplines I have ever practiced is to take time at the beginning or the end of each day to look for five things for which to linger in gratitude. It seems to pack more punch to be as specific as possible. So instead of naming my family, 
I'd suggest ferreting out one particular moment or interaction with one particular family member. Instead of saying my home, I might say, for example, that 10 minute interlude where I just sat by the fire and stared at the falling snow. I know it sounds simplistic or even trite, but it is mindfulness to these simple moments, savoring the simplicities that can most fill us with a fresh new awareness of grace. It is amazing the power this simple practice has to change the way we experience our lives. When I first began this, about a week into it, something happened and I thought to myself, oh, I know that's gonna be on my gratitude list tonight. And I realized I was sort of subconsciously looking for things that would make the list. Well, seek and ye shall find. And pretty soon you're finding a lot more of it than you used to and your heart starts to get softer and your spirit more open and your vision more clear and you're less defensive and reactive and you're doing more scooching and less bogging. One might say that to learn to live from a baseline of gratitude in part is to live in grace. And so I close with a passage from Anne Morrow Lindbergh, who said this, I want, first of all, to be at peace with myself. I want a singleness of eye, a purity of intention, a central core to life. I want, in fact, to borrow from the language of the saints, to live in grace as much of the time as possible. I'm not using this term in the strictly theological sense. By grace, I mean an inner harmony, essentially spiritual, which then translates into outer harmony to affect the world. I would like to achieve a state of inner spiritual grace from which I could function and give as I was meant to in the eye of God. Vague as this definition may be, I believe most people are aware of periods in their lives when they seem to be in grace and other periods when they feel out of grace, even though they may use different words to describe these states. In the first happy condition, one seems to carry all one's task before one lightly as if borne along on a great tide. And in the opposite state, one can hardly tie a shoestring. Living in grace is in large part simply about living in gratitude. Let us learn to live in gratitude, even on the long route, in the midst of our going. God bless you on the journey.